KBOIP with part two of tuning and matching networks. In the first video, I showed the difference between a tuned circuit, which is resonant, series or parallel. That's old radio from about the 1910s up to about 1970. And that's a technology that is mostly in the TR3. It's called tune plate, tune grid, resonant, very simple math. More complex networks like this T network and larger expansions into bandpass networks and such are very difficult to calculate because they are a pile of complex math. And they basically couldn't be solved until the computer era. And that's why about in the 1970s we began seeing bandpass networks and radio transmitters. And uh, all our modern rigs have bandpass coupling now. But the purpose of this coupling is that it's not resonant. Th this is not a resonant circuit. This is a resistive matching circuit. Resistance in is transformed to resistance out by complex math. Radio Engineer's Handbook by Terman and the paper by Nick Najad from Berkeley are good sources to study on that, but they don't explain how this works. And I beat my head against the table figuring it out. And once I did, I found that the complication is in complex math that they really can't show. And Nick Najad shows a, a fairly simple form of, of transforming from impedance to admittances back and forth as, as this network basically folds up like the old time wooden rulers with the brass rivets. It's initially folded up into a compact rectangle, but for measuring longer lengths, unfold the segments. Well, the process for for transforming this output resistance to the input is similar to that. It folds, it combines these values, folds them into admittance. That becomes admittance, add them together, back to an impedance in the series with that, and that transforms to the input resistance. But the bandpass filters have eliminated the need, for example, to do plate and load tuning in this old transmitter because this is a pi network. The modern bandpass filters, such as in the Kenwood, eliminate that because they're essentially a constant resistive transform across the entire band. And that's the magic of, of Foster's Ladders Network. A bandpass shape is really implying a constant resistance transform across a band. That's what it really means. It's really not about frequency, it's about matching resistive values. This is a topic of complex impedances. So it's necessary to go study and understand how to calculate those, and it gets a little messy, but it's vital. As before, with tuned circuits, there's an output load, 50 ohms, antenna, dummy load, whatever. In series with it is a capacitor. At no time is that resonant. The capacitor increases the impedance, guaranteed. Those two components can be equated to an impedance, the square root of R squared plus X squared, where X is the capacitive reactance for the frequency, or also in the form of R minus X. And here I deviate from the books for a reason. The books all say R plus or minus JX, but that's wrong. That's jumping ahead too far because the J is the complex operator but this is not complex impedance yet. It's about to become it. But just in that serious form, this is real, not complex. What real means in my context of R plus or minus X, not JX, is referring to the graph with the horizontal axis being resistance and the vertical being reactance. And our real circuits like this series circuit with series RC exists in quadrant four of that graph, where this is resistive values increasing. Either way, on the y-axis is the increase in reactance, but this side is negative for capacitive, this side is plus for inductive. So this is real here, but through complex math, the resistance transform process goes over here into the imaginary quadrants, and that requires the J for housekeeping through the complex math process because J represents the square root of negative one. And we cannot possibly accomplish this transform without that J. 
the transform occurs here from the output resistance of say 50 ohms back to some higher value looking back here past L1 back to the input. The process for reducing this to this point as an impedance takes complex math. And Nick Najad shows the process of, for example, finding the impedance, the Z here, inverting that, making it an admittance, which is Y, which is a shunt. Because while these two components are in series with regard to current, when, it's, when these two together are across L sub 1, then that combination of these two together and this are in shunt or parallel. And they cannot be computed by impedance. They got to be converted to admittance form, added, then converted back to impedance. So this point right here looks like an impedance to this circuit over here. That's a impedance to admittance transform. Y is admittance. The combination of C sub 2 and R sub L, the load, is a Z and impedance. The inverse of impedance is Y admittance. The inductance, L sub 1, is also an impedance by itself, but to add it in complex math to this combination means that it must be also converted to admittance form. So in that case, the inductor is a Z, an impedance. The inverse of that is the admittance of L1. And those are combined, the admittance of the RC, series network and the admittance of the inductor are added to get total admittance. That is complex math. The plus or minus J operator is invoked and there's no way around it. And at that point, magically, the resistance has been transformed to a higher value. This is impossible in tuned circuits. And this R transform is what the nature of matching networks is all about. But this transform occurs because of the complex math. What that becomes is a Y sub T, a total admittance at the point here. That point there is this point here. And the point is, they're both looking back towards the input. Z is complex. An R transform and the R resistive value at that point is approximately equal to the input resistance. Well, actually, it's exactly equal. The resistive transform has been accomplished by that point. And again, the R minus the capacitive reactance in the Z form becomes the admittance form 1 over R minus XC. It's just the inverse. That's the admittance form. Here's where it gets messy. We can't operate on that directly. So we got to do a complex transform, which is in exactly this form. 1 over R minus X of C in this case, times taking this portion, flipping the sign, and multiplying top and bottom by that. That results in, in the numerator, R plus X sub C, in the denominator, it's the products of R times R is R squared. R times plus XC is R X sub C. Minus X sub C times R is minus R X sub C. And X sub C times X sub C is X sub C squared. Algebra. So it becomes this. These two are exactly the same magnitude. They're the same thing, different signs, so they cancel out, leaving... Going back to the R plus GX form, that leaves R plus X of C over R squared plus X of C squared down here. This is not variables. This is a number, maybe a four decimal place number. And to return from this intermediate form, if you will, back to impedance, this number is divided into this which will reduce the magnitudes of these.
but that's complex math. The denominator is a coefficient of, of magnitude. This product here will be essentially the same at that point as the input resistance. Not exactly the same because there's another transform when it's mixed with the inductor, but it's close. And this can be used to approximate very simply our plus x sub c over the product r squared plus x squared to very simply and quickly approximate what the input resistance is going to be if we don't know. That has to go back to the impedance form with an R transform. And the output from that transform will be back in the impedance, will be, be back in this form without the complex R plus X. That's back into simple form, if you will. That's represented as Z sub O, Z sub out. That's in parallel with the inductor. They can't be added. They got to be changed to, an, to admittances. So X of L1 becomes the Y of L1 by inverting the impedance, which is 1 over X sub L. And the Z sub O branch here must be converted to a Y sub O admittance to then be able to add Y of the inductor and Y of the output branch. And those just simply mathematically add. To convert that back to impedance requires going back up here with that R and X value up here and doing this again. Since it's in the admittance form, this combination has got to be put back in the impedance form by this same process. Going through the complex math and out the other end comes an impedance. That impedance is the, the total of all this at this point, which was also that point, which is now this point. So from Z sub 0, combining with L1, this, this whole thing here becomes Z sub 1. The component values are sort of folded up and compacted. This Z sub 1 has the exact value of the input resistance. It'll have, for example, a net inductive impedance, so to speak, which would be Z sub 1 is R plus X because it's inductive. So to get back to a resistive input value, the residual inductive reactants here must be negated more or less by a series capacitor. So that capacitor value is found by knowing what the remaining inductive reactance is after this transform and making the capacitive reactance equal and opposite. And that is, technically speaking, a resonance. But it's not as simple as saying that, that there are components in that network that are resonant. This can't be resonant because if it is, this point will appear to be an open circuit. That's for this pi network, such as in the Drake. Capacitor on the left plate, capacitor on the right load. There are formulas in Radio Engineer's Handbook for directly calculating those values. We don't learn a thing by doing that. What's happening here is that adjusting the value of the load capacitance is accomplishing, helping to accomplish a transform here by taking this low output resistance, considering this is a series circuit because the output current in series flows through the load and the inductor here. That's a low impedance. The Transform to a higher impedance comes by inverting this combination to the admittance, and inverting that, putting them together, and that transform becomes then this and this, which is also, for the same three components, a parallel network. So these three components are at the same time series, not resonant, and parallel, not resonant. But to increase the resistive value for the resistive transform, these two values are close to resonant so that the net here is a higher impedance. And that's how the transform back to this higher input resistance works. And the books don't tell you that. You've got to 
go through the torturous path of doing this math to see what it is, and I wish they would explain it because it's really neat. Because that, that's what happens when we falsely th say that the plate is resonated. By adjusting the plate capacitance, we get a dip in, in current and, and an increase in output. Yes, that, technically speaking, is resonant with the residual inductive reactants here. But what's really happening is not resonance, but maximum power transfer. Because the entire point of this matching network is for at that frequency to match this higher resistive value, which may be several thousand, down to the antenna system, which may be 50. So it's the transform that matters. And adjusting the play control is canceling out that residual reactance, making that totally resistive for maximum power transfer. Problem is, and this is where the fallacy and the myths and the lies about those being tuners are a problem that comes home to re to ruin our signals is that if if these ports are not resistive then there are high losses in here says Terman so when we foolishly try to use this fake tuner at the transmitter to match a transmission line that's reactive there's no way won't work losses go up and that is the reason why those aren't tuners. You can't use a resistive matching network to match ports with impedances. They must be purely resistive. When they are, then there's very little loss in here. And that is what the silver boxes on my antenna systems do. They're L networks, which match a 50 ohm transmitter to, in those cases, to 75 ohm transmission line, but the antennas are perfectly tuned or perfectly matched. So the, the black cables coming in those boxes appear to be 75 ohms resistive. And this, the silver PL259 is a 50 ohm transmitter and there's a resistive transform in between. And as proof of that efficiency, as that's connected right there on the 40 meter antenna, that's what I used with a Rigel generator to work almost 200 miles into Georgia with a milliwatt. If there were high losses here, there is no way that could be done. Incidentally, this network does have a bandpass response. It's very broad, looks somewhat like that. That's what I'm designing in my uh, the new uh, 3-400 amp I'm designing from scratch, everything new. But I'm going to use fixed values for all these to eliminate the very expensive high voltage variable components but I'm relying on that match being pretty close in here, close enough, but exploiting the fact that that, that network is, is rather broad. A, a, a bandpass network might look like this, very, very sharp, but that takes a lot more components. So that's a way to take an understanding of these networks and, and do something practical with them. And in the process, it will cut the cost of making that amplifier by $1,000, perhaps. That's, uh, that's worth a little math. And here's a test circuit of what will be the amplifier output. That will be the like the inductor that's in it. And I'll mock it up with the exact values of capacitance and inductance and test it on the RF generator and uh, find the bandpass response and uh, see that I can calculate what the mismatch will be. KBYP out.